Well, one of our sons is a student at the University of Minnesota, so a couple of months ago, after spending some time at home over Christmas break, he had to uh, make the 400-mile drive back to Minneapolis. And it had snowed the night before, and it was very, very cold that morning, and he was planning to leave at like 7 a.m., and so like almost all parents, I made sure I gave him a little um, unsolicited advice before he left. I said, you know, remember, take it easy, um, I know you got a long way to go, it's cold, the roads are probably going to be a little icy and slick, so just be extra careful. So he promised me he would, and then jumped into his beautiful 1999 Mercury Mountaineer and took off. About an hour later, my cell phone rings, and it's my son, and he said he's in a ditch outside of Rockford, because, you know, the roads were icy and slick, and uh, I find, after I found out he was okay, um, I got most of the story. He said someone had changed lanes right in front of him. He just tapped the brakes and went into a skid and wound up in the ditch, couldn't get back on the road. Later, I found out that that skid and tapping of the brakes involved a 360-degree spin and very dangerous, but he was fine. I, I, found, I told him I was glad he was okay and um, that he should call AAA uh, to come pull him out because we have a AAA membership. But I warned him. I said, it's going to probably take a couple of hours for him to get to you because there's probably all kinds of other cars off the road as well because the roads are icy and slick. So he said he'd call. I said, call me um, after you talk to AAA. So about 15 minutes later, my phone rings again, and it's my son. He says he's called AAA. They'll be there in about an hour. And then while we're talking on the phone, I can hear him sort of get off the phone and say, I'm okay. No, I'm fine. And then he paused. He gets back in the phone. And he goes, hang on, Dad. I've got to jump off. I'll, I'll call you back in a minute. And he hangs up. So I wait. I don't know what's happening. And about 15 minutes after that, he calls again and says he's back on the road and everything's fine. I said, what happened? And he said, well, while I was talking on the phone, this big pickup truck rumbles up onto the shoulder right where I'm off the road. And there's a lady driving this truck, looks to be in her early 30s. She's wearing a Green Bay Packer hat and a jacket. And she hollers out of her window, hey, you okay? And he says, yeah, that's what I heard. And then she goes, he says, I've called AAA, I'm fine. She goes, well, I can pull you out right now. And that's when he said, hang on, I'll get back to you. And this lady jumped out of her truck, Green Bay Packer hat and all, grabbed chains out of the back of her truck, crawled underneath his car in the snow, hooked him up, dragged him back out onto the road, and he was fine. So a lady he had never met before, and didn't want any money. He never even got her name. She came alongside and helped. Now, I start with that story because last week we began a nine-part series on the Holy Spirit. And the whole series could really be called the Helper. Because that's the name Jesus gives to the Holy Spirit. We began in John chapter 14. Jesus is with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper, the night before his crucifixion. He's telling them he's going to be leaving them, but he promises that the Father will send another helper to be with them forever. And last week we learned that the helper is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit enables us to experience relationship with God through the presence of Christ. Now today Jesus is teaching us even more about what the helper is. Does. We're jumping ahead a couple chapters to John chapter 16. So you can look in your Bible or watch the screens as I read, and I'll pause a couple times along the way, and then we'll dig in. John 16, verse 7, Jesus is speaking still at the Last Supper. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For, I, for if I do not go away, the helper, and that word helper, you remember, is the Greek word parakletos, which means one who comes alongside the help, like the lady in the Green Bay Packer hat, um, sometimes translated advocate or counselor or comforter. He says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And let's pause there for a moment. This is remarkable. Jesus is telling his disciples that it's actually to their advantage that he leave them. How can that possibly be true? But if we think about it, it's really kind of obvious. So Jesus is with the disciples as the incarnate Son of God. He's in the flesh. And as a man in the flesh, he can really only be with them the way we are with each other. One at a time, one-on-one, -on -one, or with a small group of them. 
He can't be with all of them all of the time everywhere because he's in the flesh. But if he goes and sends the helper, the Holy Spirit, who is not limited by a physical body, now the Holy Spirit can be with each one of them all the time, 24-7, anywhere in the world. That's what Jesus is saying. As author J.D. Greer puts it, the Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. Interesting, but true. Verse 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Okay. Jesus says the helper will do three things. Will convict, guide, and glorify. Let's jump into the first one. The, the helper, the Holy Spirit, convicts. A few weeks ago, I uh, traveled to Florida to watch uh, some college baseball games, and two stories happened on the same day that later I saw sort of illustrate what Jesus is teaching us about the Holy Spirit here. So stay with me. Two stories on the same day. So I get to Florida, and in the airport, I rented a car uh, that I had arranged ahead of time just so I could get around. And it was, uh, you know, rental cars are brand new. It's like a 2018 model. And I drive, my, the car I drive doesn't look that bad, but it's a 1999. So I drive older cars. And these new cars have all sorts of cool stuff on them. It's push button start. You know, I had to ask, how do you start this thing? There's no key. You know, you just push button start. There was a dial instead of a gear shift lever. A dial, like a dial. I had to figure that out. It had uh, a, a camera somewhere in the back. So when you backed up, a picture pops up, and you can see what you're backing up. It was just amazing, all this cool stuff. So I was, you know, having a good time in this new car, um, driving around. And I'm on my way to one of the ball fields, and I was, a, uh, it was in a strange area. And I, I was a little confused by the road markings on this. There's like two turn lanes and the arrows. And so I slowed down to make sure I made the right turn. And evidently, I slowed down a little too much for the guy right behind me. Because he peeled out around me. I mean, it's Florida. It was warm. Windows are down. And he just yells at me as he's going by, hey, open your eyes. And I think he might have gestured. He was not happy. Right? Not happy. That's the first story. So I go to the game. After the game, it's late, it's dark, like 9 p.m. And now I've got to find my way to my hotel. And so I noticed as I was driving that the headlights just seemed a little dim, like for a brand new car. And so, but I, you know, everything's automatic, so I assume they're on. They're a little bit, I'm fiddling around. I find the high beams. That's too bright, so I turn them off. Oh, maybe they're just a little bit dim, you know, these new cars. So I'm driving along. Not two minutes after that, I see the flashing lights in my rearview mirror. I get pulled over by a cop in a rental car in Florida late at night. And he comes up. He's got the flashlight. And I'm sure he's thinking I'm under the influence of something because I've slowed down. I'm, you know, weaving around the road trying to find the, 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 the lights. And he says, sir, do you realize you're driving with all your lights off? Oh, uh, about that. Uh, I said, I, I, I thought they were on. I just rented a car. I didn't know where the button was. And he starts laughing. This, this police, because I think he could tell. I'm just some pathetic old guy trying to drive a car. And he goes, he goes, yeah, you know, these cars, everything's automatic except the lights. And he reaches in the car, in the window, and just goes, tick, and turns on my lights for me. And he goes, have a safe night, and walks away. Okay? Both stories are about conviction, but two very different kinds of conviction. Listen again, John 16. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now the word translated convict here means to convince. Con to convince with solid, compelling evidence. To expose or to prove wrong. In short, to convince of truth. Did you see the story um, last couple of weeks about the maybe maybe a month or so ago about the guy who built his own steam-powered rocket to prove the world is flat? Did you see this guy? 
well, it's a great story. Put that back up there, the, the rocket, okay? Um, his name is Mike Hughes. He's a 61-year-old limo driver who built a homemade steam-powered rocket, launched himself 1,800 feet into the air in an attempt to prove the world is flat. So he believes the earth is shaped like a Frisbee, okay? This is not an actual photo, by the way. Now, he didn't get high enough to get a good look. Uh, he had to get like four miles high to see the curvature of the earth. But he did get a lesson in physics. As his rocket came down faster than he thought, crashed, he wound up in a hospital with a sore back. He survived, but he learned a lesson in physics. Now, how would you go about convincing a guy like Mike Hughes that the earth is, in fact, round? You would have to use solid, compelling evidence, right? You would try to use truth. Jesus says he will, the Holy Spirit will, convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Now, often I think we misunderstand this role of the Holy Spirit, what Jesus is saying here. We sort of assume that the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is to point out where we fall short, to, you know, kind of make us feel guilty. We think of the Holy Spirit like the guy who yelled at me in the car when he was passing by me. Hey, open your eyes. Get yourself in line or God's going to get you for that. Like the guy who told me one time right here in this, ser- this sanctuary after a sermon, Pastor Brian, you, you almost had me feeling guilty. He goes, I, that's why I come to church. I want to feel guilty, he said. But that's not what Jesus says here. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. He says, the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin. Now, what's the world? Who's the world? The world is those who do not yet believe. We'll get to his role in us as believers in just a moment. Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit works to convict, to convince the world, those who do not yet believe in him, of the sin of failing to believe in him. The fundamental sin is failure to trust Christ as the source of all salvation. So before someone can come to faith in Jesus, and the Bible says that one time that was all of us, before we can come to faith in Jesus, we must be convinced of the truth of Jesus, and that's the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must convince us that there is such a thing called sin, and that that sin separates us from a holy God, and that Jesus is the solution to that problem. Now, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, it goes like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We all know that verse, but verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not to condemn, but rather to convict, to convince, in order to save, to help. Like the officer who pulled me over and turned on my lights. He convinced me, convicted me, in order to help me. Now the Bible teaches there is one who accuses. Jumping ahead to Revelation chapter 12. John writes, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. The accuser is not God. The accuser here is Satan, the enemy of God. More on that in just a moment. Jesus says the helper, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. So every single one of us who has come to faith in Christ has experienced the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because it's by the Holy Spirit we can even begin to believe the truth about Jesus. Next, Jesus teaches us about what the helper does in us as believers now. He says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you 
will see me no longer. Who's the you here? Who's he talking to? He's no longer talking about the world, those out there, those who do not believe. He's talking directly to his disciples, to you who are with me right now, to us as his followers. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, but convinces us, his followers, of righteousness, he says. Now, what does it mean to be convicted of righteousness? What does that mean? The word righteousness means approved by God or to be in right standing with God. So the Spirit, the Helper, convicts, convinces us of our right standing before God. Now, remember, the word Jesus uses to describe this Holy Spirit is parakletos, which means helper or advocate. That means there is a legal sense to this word, like a defense attorney, like one who pleads your case. It's actually what Paul refers to later in Romans chapter 8 when he writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life, watch this, the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Case closed. If I had a gavel, that would have been very dramatic. Case closed. A few verses later, Romans 8, 15, and 16. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So, the helper, the advocate, reminds us that by virtue of his death and resurrection, Christ has conferred upon us, has clothed us in his righteousness. There is therefore now no condemnation. We've been adopted. Now notice the role of the Holy Spirit is the exact opposite of the accuser. The accuser points a finger. The accuser points a finger and says, you you call yourself a Christian. You think God loves you? You think he forgives you? What about that? What about that? What about that? You can't possibly be forgiven. You can't possibly have been adopted. You're still guilty. That's the accuser. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reminds us, convinces us, convicts us of our righteous standing before the Father. That in Christ there is no condemnation. Our identity is as his children. So the Holy Spirit convinces us that our sins, all our sins, past, present, future, were nailed to the cross. That's why the gospel is such good news. Jesus says there's one more thing, however. Listen again. All three areas of conviction. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. That's the first thing. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no longer. Concerning judgment Because the ruler of this world is judged. Who is the ruler of this world? We look out at the world, and every day we see stories like, I mean, if you just go on your Twitter feed, you watch the news at night, we see chemical weapons in Syria, we see child soldiers in Africa, we see terrorism all over the world, or in our own nation. We see domestic violence, the opioid ec- epidemic, sex trafficking, the abuse of children. It just never ends. And we think to ourselves, what's wrong? So much pain and brokenness. What's wrong? The Bible teaches there is an enemy, the one called the adversary, the opposer, the liar, the destroyer. The ruler of this world, in Jesus' words, is Satan, the accuser, who set himself against God, who hates God, who's against us, who's against Christ, who's against the cross, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy, who accuses. But what does it mean that he's been judged, that he's judged? Jesus is saying that Satan is already judged, already defeated. In John 14, just a few verses earlier, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. And then this, he has no claim on me. What he's saying is that by Jesus' death and resurrection, the ruler of this world is already judged, already defeated, 
He has no claim on us. We need not fear. He has no claim. He's been defeated. So secondly then, we see here the helper, the Holy Spirit guides. If you're like me, you have a hard time remembering what life was like before we had these. Cell phones. Sometimes my wife and I will say, how do we ever get anywhere before we had a cell phone? Well, cell phones are smartphones. You know, there's little tiny little computers now. We can do everything from take photographs and videos to send email and all sorts of stuff. They, they, they just do everything. But a few years ago, when I was just getting used to my very first so-called smartphone, I had driven into Chicago to watch one of my boys play a high school basketball game, and I'd never been to this, this school before, um, so I was in an unfamiliar area of the city. But I think I got there by following someone who knew how to get there. After the game, it's dark, I come out to the parking lot, and I'm, I no longer have someone to follow, and I get in my car, and I realize as I'm heading out of the parking lot, I don't know which way to turn. It's dark, I'm in the city, I don't know which way to go. And then I remembered that someone had told me that, your, that my phone, this newfangled smartphone, had maps on it or something, some sort of map. So I, I, slowed, I stopped before I left the parking lot, and I looked at my phone, and I, I saw a little icon that said maps. So I touched that, and my phone started to speak to me. I didn't know it could do that. It said, where would you like to go? And I almost jumped out of the car, like, what? And I said, 1205 down at Corp. Batavia, Illinois. And it said, turn right in 50 feet. I'm like, whoa. It, it, it guided me all the way home. It was amazing. Jesus continues here in John 16. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, for he will declare to you the things that are to come. Lots of talk in our culture today about truth. We hear it all the time. You know, speak your truth. Follow your truth. Find your truth. The irony is, by and large, our culture no longer believes in truth, particularly spiritual truth. Our culture no longer believes that truth comes from a transcendent, eternal God, a personal God, who's revealed himself through his word. Our culture does not believe that, by and large. Our culture believes that we must each create our own spiritual truth. But here, Jesus is not talking about your truth or my truth. He's talking about his truth truth, the truth of God's word. It says, whatever he hears, he will speak. <coughs> Excuse me, whatever he, he will declare to you the things that are to come. At this point, the disciples don't have the New Testament that we have, right? They only have Jesus. He's leaving. He says, the helper, the spirit will come and will tell you all things, will give you truth. Paul says later in 2 Timothy, all scripture is God breathed. God breathed. The Holy Spirit is the wind, the breath of God. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In Hebrews we read, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So when Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He's saying the Holy Spirit is going to reveal God's word through the apostles, and then he's going to help us, centuries later, <coughs> excuse me, understand the truth of God's word. So when someone comes to me, which happens quite often, or to Jeff, or to Pastor Sterling, or to Andrew, after we preach something from God's word, and says, Boy, it sounded like you were, it just felt like you were speaking right to me today. One person even asked me one time, are you looking in my windows? And I always say, that's not me. I hope you know that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit illuminating your heart and mind through his word. The Holy Spirit guides, the Holy Spirit speaks, but it's also important to say the Holy Spirit is not the same as our emotions, our desires, and our whims. I knew a guy years ago uh, who used the Holy Spirit as a dating strategy. He's at a Christian college, you know, it's all these Christian kids, and he would have his eye on a certain young lady, and he would say, you know, I, I, just, I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to go out. And it would work until 
one young lady kind of saw through his, his thing, you know, and he said that, and he, she said, well, you know, the Holy Spirit talks to me too, and he says, you're a jerk. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can prompt and can nudge through prayer in our circumstances. We'll talk about that later in the series. But primarily, <coughs> Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit will guide us through his word. Through truth. Back in John 14, Jesus had said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all I have said to you. Here's what I think Jesus wants us to know. The Holy Spirit guides us with truth by enabling us to understand God's Word. But it's God's Word that teaches us about the Holy Spirit. It's always both, God's Word and the Spirit. The Spirit and God's Word. So the Holy Spirit guides. And thirdly, today, the Helper glorifies. The Holy Spirit glorifies. Quite often I'm asked, uh, like many of you are, to do references for people. Maybe it's a student applying for college or someone uh, doing a job interview. And, it, and I'm, a, I'm always glad to do those because I've had to ask lots of people to do those for me and I try to do them right away. And in most cases, when I'm asked, it means I know the person and I, I, I can actually do a reference and I know something about their character, their abilities, their talents. And it's a joy, most often, to recommend them. It's easy to speak highly of them. And my job on that reference is to make them look good. That's kind of what Jesus is saying here. He says, he will glorify me. To glorify means to honor or to ascribe weight or significance to make famous. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Okay, here's the question. Who does the Holy Spirit glorify? He glorifies Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit does not glorify himself. And this is part of the reason why the Holy Spirit is, is often difficult for us to understand and experience. Uh, because the Holy Spirit does not want to draw attention to himself or to bring glory to himself. His purpose is to glorify Jesus. That's why often the Holy Spirit is indistinguishable to us from Jesus himself. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 3. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You see that? The Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives and our hearts by faith, but the driving passion and purpose of the Holy Spirit is to point us to Jesus, to teach us about Jesus, to remind us of what Jesus have, has done, to make Jesus famous, so that the one we praise and worship and experience is Jesus. Now notice. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you see that? Jesus says all that the Father has is mine. Now we kind of get that. God the Father, God the Son, Father, Son, the whole connection thing there we get. Father gives the Son everything that's his. We sort of understand that. It's what all fathers want to do. But then he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. So often, I think, our default mode, even as people of faith, is to think that God always wants something from us. That he wants something from us. He wants our obedience. He wants our worship. He wants our money. He wants our service. Jesus says before any of that, the Holy Spirit wants to give us not just something, but everything that is His. His presence, His righteousness, His truth, His grace, His power, His life. So that, get this, He is glorified in and through us. Because the Spirit always glorifies Jesus, and the Spirit lives in us so that our lives can glorify Jesus too. That's what he's saying. Paul refers to this later in 2 Corinthians when he says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory 
are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, watch this, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Think about that. Of all the ways Jesus could choose to be glorified, of all the ways he could choose to be honored, to be significant, to be made famous in this world, the beauty of a sunset, the power of a thunderstorm, the vast expanse of creation itself, through all those ways he could choose. Jesus says he's chosen to be glorified through you, through us, through this, his church, because the Holy Spirit takes all that is his and gives it to you. Astonishing thought. Hope you stay with us through every week of this series as we continue. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you today for your word, for your truth. We thank you for the promise and presence and work of the Holy Spirit, who, as Kenton said, is here, does live within us by faith. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to continue to convince us of our standing before the Father of our righteousness in Christ. Continue to guide us into all truth through your word. And I ask you to glorify Jesus in and through even us. It's in your name that we pray.